Good morning, it's Vaughan at Westcote Bell Pottery. Um, January 13th, I think it is today. Another storm today. Um, it's just one after another this year, but we haven't had much snow. It's just been rain and high winds and high surge for the for the ocean. But um, so tonight will be a big storm surge and we're supposed to get really high wind. Uh, that's what it looks like out there. Just gray at the moment. Um, pigeons are actually, oh, he's looking like he's interested in the other one. <laughs> so but anyway, it's um, spring's coming soon. But um, so I've been given my marching orders. I got to get to work. Um, my wife wants me to make these um, and she's getting, going to make some lids uh, or add some sculptural heads onto the tops. And the owl there will have some wing attachments, I think, by the look of it. But anyway, I've got to make these basic jars for her, so I figured I would show you. It's just white clay and throwing some forms, really. But um, So, I've prepared my clay. I've got some different weights of clay. Um, and uh, I'm going to try and make some cylinders. But uh, first, it's time for a cup of uh, coffee. Mmm, that's good coffee. Okay, so we've got some power. Yep, we have some power. I wonder what that's doing here. That's my wiggle wire. Ooh. So whenever you're going to throw, you've got to make sure you've got some good clay. So it's right, brand new clay right out of the bag. I don't wedge my clay as you've seen. In all my videos, if it's rush out of the bag, it's just gone through a pug mill and it's been wrapped up tight in plastic, it should be perfect today. So if it was when they made it, it should be today. And if not, I'll cone it a couple of times on the wheel, up and down, up and down, and then it's not it's not the same as wedging, but I call it wheel wedging when you do that. So this is the biggest one, so this is the one that's gonna be meant to be an owl. So it'll just be a slightly curved cylindrical form. That is three pounds of clay, just under maybe two and three quarters. And it feels pretty soft. Don't let these flaps trap any air underneath when you put a square down like that. So yeah, I think that's probably two and a half to three. Okay, so let's... This wheel doesn't make any noise. My recent videos I've been using my squeaky wheel, so that's why I was overdubbing the, vo the uh, audio understand it. It's pretty squeaky when it comes through some speakers, but it's actually, oh, 35 year old wheel at least. So who did I get that one from? I got that one from Tim Martha, I think, uh, in Columbus, Ohio at the time. I think Tim, he has a Facebook page. He's uh, a professor at Indiana University, if I'm right, I'm not mistaken. Clay feels good. I used to see Tim at Columbus Winter Fair in Ohio. I've got several of his teapots and some tea bowls. The tea bowls, we had a little, quite a few, but one by one they sort of bit the dust. I still have two or three. We use them every day. That's why I like making tea bowls. So this one doesn't need a very wide foot or base print footprint. I always do that, pull my finger from two o'clock down to the center because I open it up this way so I compress it that way. No S cracks that way. Dribble water so it goes down both sides. You go for your first pull, which is just a little height you can try and gain. So lots of pressure with the outside fingers. It's drying out, so I've got to let go slowly. See how dry that looks there? Oop. Sponge is trying to go for a travel. Wants to go on holiday. Okay, now I'm going to put pressure on with the outside fingers again. The inside fingers are sort of giving way. There's a little air bubble just around there. I could feel it. My pug mill's a year old now, and I use it at least once a week. <clears throat> a 
Now I'm going to do even pressure inside and out to try and get height and width a little bit. There's the air bubble just there. My wife wants this one to go in and then collapse down a little bit and have like a bumpy shoulder like and the head sunken a little bit so I'll have to wait for this clay to stiffen up a little bit. Let's see if we can see that air bubble. Yeah there it is right there. So do I have a needle here? Yeah there it is. Now you could get rid of an air bubble maybe by wedging. But a lot of times you can wedge and you'll still have the air bubble there. So I've actually found it easier. You just pop it a couple of times in like that and then rub from all the way around it. And then kind of close up the hole. You get rid of it. It's a lot easier than wedging. Just see if I can get a little bit more on this form. Here's the air bubble. It feels like I just pinched the hole up a little bit more then. The clay was quite soft. I don't want to thin it too much at the top because my wife wants me to make it cave down a little bit and then have a sunken lid in there which means I have to come back to it anyway, but I'll try and get as close as I can to it. Okay, so I'm gonna drag the sponge from the very bottom, because there's water in there now. So we'll have water in the sponge now, and then drag it up evenly all the way up, slowly, so I know it's in contact all the way up. That way it's dragging any slippery water on the wall on the inside to the other areas on the inside that are dry. And you should be able to do a pull after this that's not interfered with by feeling like it's dry, slippy, dry, slippy kind of thing. And that's important when you're doing a long pull that you don't have to stop halfway because you need to add some water. So making it even all the way up is a good prep to your pull. Okay, I haven't closed the hole up because I need to get my hand still. Let's have a look at that drawing again. Where did I put it? That's what it's supposed to look like. So, um, so I need to get a little bit more of a belly. That's where the air bubble was. So the inside was totally even smoothness, slipperiness, whatever you want to call it, uh, all the way up further because of that first sponge pull, just dragging it over the surface all the way up. Okay, so that's a, the watery bit that was on the surface. I just pulled it off. That looks more like the form she wanted. So how far can I make this go down without it collapsing? Usually you'd stop at the, just before this point, because now I'm level, so there's a chance it will just slop and fall right in. But what I'm trying to do is give myself a little bit so I can stop before it collapses, and then when I come back it's just a matter of putting some pressure down. So I've got to be careful of that area, because that's where the 
likelihood is of it collapsing just in that area there. So I'm drying it off. Make sure there's no water there that's going to soften that little bit and then take it off. Let it sit for an hour, maybe to an hour and a half. And I should be able to make that go down even further. It's not a jar that I can see a function for. Um, be hard to get a spoon in it and things like that. So I think she's thinking of this more of a little sculpture jar. But we've got to leave it because it's definitely feeling soft. It wasn't a stiff piece of clay. And I'll watch it right here so I can show you if it collapses. It is so close to going down. But anyway, we'll see. And now I've got some cylinders to do. Okay, so this is just a, a smaller cylinder. She wants two small cylinders with a slight curve, but they still have a very narrow base. So I'm gonna to compress towards the front, from two o'clock to the center. It was Robin Hopper that told me to do this. I was at a workshop with him 30 odd years ago. Well, not told me, told the whole group. Somebody was having problems with S cracks. Oh, I know who it was. It was my assistant, Virginia Gear O'Clock, who now lives, I think her name is now Virginia Parker. Parker. Uh, she lives in San Antonio, Texas, and she was my old apprentice. And she's actually a, still a young looking lady. She's actually, a, I think, a principal in a school, a primary school in Texas. Hi, Virginia. Okay, so let's. I can hear the waves and the wind. I'm not sure if you're picking that up in the volume, in the audio. Wait a minute, the sea level, right? Sea level is actually still fairly low though. Once it gets higher, you can really hear the waves as they hear the pilings, which I'll call Bigfoots here, that just buried in the seabed and then they stick up about 12 feet and hold my building up. I was saying in my last video, I'm thinking about building another studio up on the top of the hill because I've been gambling for 13 years now that there won't be a storm that takes my building. And I've shown you the waves and the damage to the beaches in the last video. It's getting so much worse that I've got to think ahead. So I hope to stick around for another 10 years when <laughs> I build another building. I hope the world sticks around for another 10 years. There we go. So that's a basic form. Does it look like what she wants? If you know Rumpold of the Bailey, it's she who must be obeyed. There you go. That's not far off, but the belly down there needs to be a bit wider. Good old Rumpold. Those of you in your 60s or more will remember Rumpold from the UK. He's available on YouTube too.
I watched some of his episodes recently on YouTube. A very dated series, of course. I like those old detective type things because there's no blood and gore in them. It's all left to the imagination. That's the shape she wants. And that always makes it easier to take the... And then if you turn it around like that, you can put a foot in right at the beginning of making something. Yeah, that's nice. I can trim that a bit more using those uh, foot tools I got from um, BillWrightArtisanPotteryTools.com There we go. Nice piece. Nice round thing. I think she'll be happy. I'm not going to bang this time. It is sagging on the right hand side just a touch. Okay, now I have to make an actual cylinder. So I need a wider bead. Okay, that little finger always puts pressure on just there to stop the piece from spreading out too much and keep a little bit of uh, compression in the base. But you don't want to make that too far so you get like a mushroom too much. You can get a little bit of mushroom because you can do get rid of that when you lift, but, but just compression without causing a mushroom is what you're going for. And then pull out, it's dry so I've got to get water. You always let go slowly. Your instinct, if you feel something go funny with your piece, is to let go rapidly. But you really have to always let go slowly. Now we've got to do two or three pulls. First one is just to get up to about the finger height, because I like to better reach down to the bottom again. And then I'll just fill some water over the whole thing. Now we'll do a second pull and just go at one revolution, and one finger height higher each time, but putting equal pressure on both fingers inside and out so we get some height going up. But put touch more pressure on the outside just so you don't get a flared form as well. Same again. I can reach the bottom with my inside fingers. And my wife is going to do some carving in these so she doesn't want them too thin. Thumb is right on the edge of the rim to try and level it. Sometimes you don't need to use a pin, you can just put a little pressure on there and get it level. That's the basic piece. And I'm gonna put a little foot in. And I've noticed that these pieces tend to pull in a little bit on the top um, when they're drying. So, um, to it's a nice idea, I'm going to try it this time, to make them a touch wider at the top than the bottom. And we'll see if they even out to end up being a, a perfect cylinder. Wow, that was a gust of wind. The other night, or day in the afternoon, a gust of wind shook this building. And 
if you look up Fiona last year, I think it was, or maybe the year before now, but uh, Fiona went to Newfoundland, Porto Bass, and blew the buildings right off their stilts. There you go. So that was a gentle pull with the inside fingers pushing against this rib. And that is actually still a perfect cylinder. So let's, this time I'm going to try pushing out a little bit more, make it get a little wider at the top. And we'll see if we end up with some shrinkage that pulls it in back as a cylinder. So it's wider at the top, and I think I am going to trim this off a little bit. Do I see any? Yeah, that's a bit more than I. If I squash it down and go, but I'm just going to take that off. You must rest your arm securely. Did I go inside? Yes. want the lid to stay flush and level and not wobble. Make sure I'm not tapering it in. It's supposed to go out a little bit. Okay, so you see it's wider here than it is down there. I want to see how much wider it is when it dries, see if it actually ends up being the same. Be hard to judge that ahead of time but it'll be nice isn't it a little experiment so that i'm going to throw a bunch of these forms um and uh, you can actually uh watch the rest of the video making lids and i'll show you how to do that when i've got these done okay now i've thrown all the jars i have about 10 of them uh and probably what have we got there one two three four five six seven eight now i've got eight of them <clears throat> and um, I'm just going to throw some lids. So I have my calipers somewhere around here. There you go. So this one, well, that's set from the last one. I just have to open it touch. There you go. That's the size of the lid. Um, so let's get this one made first. I usually like to make a lid for each pot. And these ones don't have the same size lids on any of them because my wife's got different jaws, different size jaws. We've got one big one to do there. Judging the clay size, that's too much clay. So we'll take a little bit off that one. The other one hasn't collapsed yet, so it's about 30 minute, 30 minutes or so old. So okay, so centering little piece of clay, throwing the lid upside down obviously. Gonna have a little lip that will go inside the jaw. And my wife wants to make sculptural lids, so I'm not gonna go down very far. Give her something a nice thick piece of clay to attach the, the lid to. And then come up. Sometimes I lift the bat off the pins when I do that kind of pull when I've got an overhang like this, so you've got to be a little careful. And now, what I usually do, and there's probably other ways of doing this, you could use a needle, but I look and I kind of put that little tool in a halfway place and push down, so I create a flange that goes out and a flange that goes up. And then 
push that down, round it up a little bit. You don't need a deep flange. This is too small, I'm going to take it out now. See how much of an overhang do we have? Not too bad. And if you want, you can it's just dribble, it can dribble water down my finger so it dribbles down the outside of the piece. I don't want to go too far out before I measure it. And I've got the, pit, the point of the wood tool going right to the foot and I'm just pressing out with my fingers and I'm going to measure now because I don't want to go too far. And there they are. Oh, we've got a long way to go yet. That's good. I, don't, I hate going too far and then having to cone it in again. Close. So now I'm going to vertical the little rim, bring it to a vertical. Let's round off that so it's not thin. I fire on stilts anyway, so, but I like my rim not to be too thin in there so it doesn't chip easily. Let's give you a look. Okay, I'd say it's just a touch big. So I'm going to use the point, that tool, to press in just a touch. Get all the water out. The wind is picking up now. It went really dark and it started to rain and it wasn't snow again. I mean, this is January 13th, and we still don't have snow in Nova Scotia. Just rain. Let's go back. Let's see if I can lift it now. Yeah, that's not too bad. Without putting water underneath. This bat has a little dent in there. This one I have are these ones. This is the larger size of these belly jars that she wanted. So this will be a smaller piece of clay. Tiny little bit of clay for this one. So I can bang it right down on that. This one, same, take this tool, put it about the halfway point, and press down and in, and you create a flange that grows high, and then flatten off that little thin area. And then this bit went wide enough all on its own. So I'm going to measure this now, because this is quite small. We're so close. Oh. Don't really need to do much to that, just press a little bit to widen it there. And she's going to ask for a sort of smooth curved lid on this one. And this is small enough to put next to the jaw. And I'll measure it one more time before I take it off. Yep, we've got that. That should fit perfectly. And see what I mean? I put water on, on these ones. Um, not sure my wire go. Oh. So the water just goes into the middle rather than flaring out. So I can pull these off very easy. And I was using, I just used a heat gun on this once. That's why I don't like the propane torches. I like to use just a regular paint strip. And that goes on the jaw right there.
Okay, I finished all the lids and I'm going to check this piece again. It's a bit stiffer now. The drawing that she gave me looks like that. So that's what she wants me to do. So I've got to try and put my finger up there and lift that up or I've got to push that down. So I'm going to try a bit of, bit of both. That's better. So I've got to put my finger underneath and try and raise up that shoulder. And then I gotta take the bottom part back down in a bit. Without it collapsing. It's hard to get my finger in there. Oops, I just dropped some liquid on there. That will make it slippery, so I gotta make sure I don't touch that area. Okay, I think I got it. I mean, I'm not unhappy that it's not snow, but this time of the year it should be snow. I'm off. It's almost like she's asking me for a neck with an owl's head on top that she will put there. Hopefully, let's pull that open. I don't get an S crap down there. I don't think it's there. I'm going to make this stopper very long. So that's pushed it in and up. So I'm going to wet it now and throw it up. I'm not sure what that purpose is, but. I think that's what she asked for. Make it a little wider. She may ask me to trim this whole, most of this flange off. stopper so I've left the underside wider than that area there so I could trim the flange off if she just wants it to be like a stopper I'm just pushing out to widen it a little bit at the bottom there so it could be a stopper that you push in until it catches and let's see what we got it's a little small if it had to be a stopper, that's all. Now it should be big enough. And we'll see what it ends up like. Here is the first one of the jars that my wife has just finished carving and putting the lid on. And if you notice, there's still a slight widening at the top, um, but it, I had it much more than that when I was throwing them. So they do tend to pull in at the top more than they do at the bottom. Um, so if you make a cylinder perfect when you throw it, it's gonna be narrower at the top when you finished it, when it's finished drying and being fired. I, don't, I never realized that, but I'd always suspected it. But it's a good thing to know. How much? I have no idea. That's a guess each time. Okay, Jackie's been doing an amazing job on carving all of these and putting the animals and birds on the lids. Um, so they're ready to trim now. And that's a nice, slightly loose lid fit. So it, with the glaze on it as well, since I fire on stilts, so I can glaze the rim on the inside. Uh, basically, that'll be a nice fit.
but she always just leaves me a little bit to carve or trim down the bottom there but there you can see what she's been up to just a lot of nice interesting carving and she showed that just in the video be nice to see what glazes we picked to go on these with all that detailed carving so I'm just going to a little trimming plus some chattering This is that little tool that I have no idea where I got it from, but it's probably available in every um, ceramic supply shop. I think it's like it's supposed to be a little handle type tool. The most fascinating places to visit are pottery supply places, of course, and hardware stores. It's like how many times could you waste an hour in a hardware store just wandering around saying, what could I use this for in my pottery studio? Even all the fasteners, the nuts, the bolts, the screws, different heads and all those things could be used as stamps in a pottery studio. all the textural things, floor mats made of rubber and whatever else that you could roll clay out onto. Jackie wanted me to leave these a little heavy for the carving that she was doing, so they're a little heavier than I would normally throw them. It'll be a good surface to do chattering on. So let's see, what will I use? Let's go with this one. This is one of Bill Wright artisanpotterytools.com. They always love to chatter. They like instantly start. And try and create a wave again. That kind of slightly at an angle wave gives it a lot of energy, I think. Pretty heavy duty part of chattering there. good. So I'm going to knock off a little bit of the debris that leaves us some loose stuff because this clay is not quite dry and it's leather hard. Move that a little bit and I'm going to dig my tool in a little bit just in there. And then maybe let's do another one just there give ourselves a double ring. And then just brush it off a little bit because they always leave a little dusty, you know, debris on the surface. I'll get that out of the lid too. And that's what we got. Hard to see with the light. This clay is 516 from Pottery Supply House, which is a smooth buff stoneware. I'm upstairs here at West Coat Bell with a pot here that Vaughn has thrown and I'm going to make an owl head for the lid and then do some texturing on the body of the pot in order to uh, make it kind of suggest an owl form and shape. First thing I'll do is just cut off a chunk of clay and kind of sit it on the lid there to see if that's about the right kind of proportion for what I want the head to the lid to the body of the pot to be. And, um, and then I'll start pushing this and carving it into a shape. I have a few sketches here just to give me a rough idea of some of the uh, textures and forms that I might want to try and get into this pot and into the head. And I'm going to start with just kind of 
getting a general a general form very general because I'll, I'll be the clay is soft I'll be able to alter it and then carve it once I get more closer to the the form that I Going to try and pull the those ear tufts of the um, horned owl just out to the side out of the same piece of clay. If I can do this all out of a single piece, um, I kind of like to try and do that because then there's no issues with um, having to attach things and not having a good um, and having a good bond. I may need to attach the beak, however, because that's going to be a very prominent um, thing to stick out the, the front. I'm going to add some clay at the top of the head. I'm going to do some scratching and scoring here. And use some some wet clay on my brush to attach this. Looks kind of funny right now, but what I want to do is get a rounder top to the head. I think it will uh, make the head look more owl-like.
this stage, I'm really using some of my tools um, to kind of push the clay around and see what gives me the best owl likeness. So I'm, uh, I trimmed these um, pieces that I attached here for the, that start the, the kind of horn piece that starts in the center of the face. And it, it really involves just a lot of pl playing around with it while not, while paying attention to the fact that the clay is going to be stiffening while I do this. Got a small piece of clay here. I, I rounded it out and then cut off a flat bit. So I'm going to start uh, forming the beak out of it. It'll of course have to be smaller than that. I'll, uh, adjust the shape and the size. I decided to smooth out those eye areas again and start uh, and do them again because they got distorted when I was attaching the beak. And I think I can get them a bit more symmetrical now that that's um, attached and the general structure of the head is all there. Okay, I just redone the eyes um, because they got kind of off center when I was attaching the beak. Um, now basically everything's attached. It just needs to be kind of cleaned up, smoothed off, get rid of some of the dry clay on here and clean up the beak area and maybe put some texture on the horns here. a good time to make sure all the joins are nice and cleaned up and, um, and are holding good.
this is ready to attach to the lid of the jar and um, if I need to make any adjustments to it once it's attached I can still do that. this point it's a good time to put the lid on the jar and get a good look it's that is not as symmetrical as I would like. I'm doubling up on these lines just because I am um, I'm thinking that when we glaze these pots it will give the glaze some interesting places to uh, gather and, and break over edges because I'm kind of counting on the glaze to um, delineate some of these textures since I'm not actually painting them. I'm using carved texture to uh, decorate the surface. Okay, I just packed all the jars in the kiln along with a whale of Jackie's and um, so I'm not sure if you can see, there is a, as you can see from the owl in the video, there's a lot of work in those knobs. <laughs> you think of it as just a knob, but those are little pieces of sculpture that take up longer to make practically than the jar. But um, anyway, they're not wet, they're not dry yet, so I'm going to uh, wait a couple of days before I fire this kiln. Good morning. Uh, today I'm going to glaze some of the textured pots, uh, lidded jars that we did, bond through them, and I've been carving some animals on the lids and um, texturing the main body. So 
Today I'm going to glaze. This first one I'm going to dip into some green and then lightly wipe it so that I'm taking some of the glaze off the, the uppermost parts of the texture and leaving things in the incised areas and, and I'll see what happens. Okay, so I've got folk art white here and an apple green glaze in back. The first thing I'm going to do is dip the bottom in the folk art white and I'm going to let it uh, get dry enough so that I can then dip the green. Um, after the green dries, I'm going to do the wiping um, in order to, ex you know, kind of accent accentuate some of the texture. dry bit so that I can handle it on the bottom. I've overlapped, I've let I've let it overlap into where I'm going to be putting the green. Good. Got a nice overlap there. Okay, now I'm going to do the lid to that jar. So I'm going to put a little bit of the folk art in the peak of the in the peak of the interior. And then I'm going to dip it. Okay, good morning. I'm going, I'm about to open the kiln and take a look at the pots that have the animal lids on top that I glazed the other week. Um, let's get started. Okay, here we go. And let's see what we've got. Um, they're on stilts, so I'm going to be very careful when I pull them out. Okay, so this one was carved with some feeling of rock and architectural motifs. And um, you can see where I kind of um, scraped into the glaze, scraped glaze off, and um, allowed it to accentuate some of the textures in there. I was trying to get everything across by using either the glaze and, uh, and the textures on the pot. A lot of carving into the surface, using a roller, different uh, tools. And let's see, this is the apple green glaze and this is the um, chun green down here. Okay, this one, boy, this one has a lot of colors layered into it. Um, the blue really hung into the, the, the deep carvings that I made into the surface. So uh, actually the blue glaze was the first layer of glaze and I then scraped a lot of it off and glazed over with the purple and I think the folk art uh, white and then down here is um, the apple green and the chun green. And again, I was sort of scraping it away so the texture really pops. And again, yeah, here the um, textures are really showing up. You can see a window here, different kinds of bricks. The idea of it is it's kind of like a boathouse right on the water here. Um, and I'm putting, uh, you know, I had initially um, a blue 
glaze under here and I scraped a lot of it off and and then I believe that's the mouse gray over top and then on this on the top part there's folk art white with purple on top sort of grazed over I'm trying to really um, activate the surface of the pot with carving and with the glazes okay so this one I did a little bit differently as you can see it's it's carved with a sort of a meandering lines and it's glazed with the matte black and the licorice so it's shiny area and uh, and matte and the head of this one I believe is a, a cat head so we'll look at that later okay and again this is another um, shape of pot matte black on top and uh and going down so this one is carved with a sort of uh curved lines that uh, kind of get have the feeling of fur um and then it's shiny so it's black matte and shiny on this one and the top of this um particular piece is, is an owl head um and as you can see, I used a lot of different colors on this one. Um, the initial uh, layer was uh, one of the greens, which you can see hanging in to the, the deep lines that separate the color areas. So when I went back into these smaller areas to do a second layer after scraping a lot of the green off, um, I used a sponge in order to stay in the area. There's no wax resist on this. It's all done by letting, uh, just taking glaze off, like putting the green on and then scraping back and then putting another glaze on top. There we go. Okay, so here's the little black cat with the, um, he's got shiny black ears. And then he's he's black, matte, and shiny. And if you can see his face. And he's matte on top, and then he goes to sh shiny on the bottom. Yeah. Okay. This is the lid for one of the boat houses. Got a little bit of crawling there, not too, not too much though. There's glaze underneath it. And here's the owl head. Again, I'm using uh, dipping and sponging in different areas, scraping things off in order to accentuate the texture. Um, not sure. <laughs> I think he's got a little bit of confusion with the lids here. A lot of times, I, um, if you can see, I like to use the similar colors on the lid to the base. So both the lid and the base have the folk art white and um, the matte green color. So here's the lid to the boathouse with the gull on top. another boathouse. This is the boathouse that's kind of sitting right on the water with the gull on top. So there's lots of different colors in this one. The greens, purples, folk art white, blues. There we go. And here's the lid to the last boathouse. The whole thing in so you can see the water motif at the bottom. And then the different bricks and windows 
shingle type textures and the roof with the bird.